Thank you so much for joining us today on A Date with Destiny. Do you know where you will be living within 60 seconds after you die? It is my prayer that if you do not know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to go to heaven when you die, that today will be the day when you truly repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. He loves you and He's waiting on you with His loving arms open wide. The title of this message is America. Please listen to the powerful voice of Almighty God. America, please listen to the powerful voice of Almighty God. Our text for this message is found in Hosea chapter 4, verse 17. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Father, in Christ's name, I thank you that before the foundation of the world, you knew that we would be here today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Uh, Father, may not one word leave my tongue, but that it does not first come from thee to me. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The northern kingdom represented by Ephraim was unfaithful to God. And God said, leave them alone. In other words, give them what they want. The gods of the United States of America today are money, sex, and sports. The question we need to ask ourselves today is simply this. Has God already turned these United States of America over to our own lust. America, please listen to the powerful voice of Almighty God. He continues to warn us that we're in very deep trouble with Him. And we must ask ourselves these questions. What happens when a nation abandons God? Is it too late for America to turn back to God? The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The national anthem of these United States of America says, Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? How can you be free in Christ as a citizen of these United States of America when you are a slave to sin? Today, at the close of this message, I'm going to give you the greatest opportunity that a spiritually lost person can ever be given. The opportunity to repent of your sins and make the Lord Jesus your very own personal Savior and Lord by faith. It's as simple as A, B, C. You're watching today, and you've never really and truly repented of your sins and accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. All you have to do is to admit that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're born into sin because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. It was paradise. And they disobeyed God. They sinned against God. And sin came into the world. Therefore, we are all born sinners. We must realize that we're sinners, admit that we're a sinner. We must admit our need for the Savior. We must admit our need. Oh, Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, I need you today. And then you must believe. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. God showed His love for us by sending His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. 
He loves us that much today. He loves you that much today. So much so that if, if you were the only person to have ever been born, he still would have sent his only son, Jesus, to die for your wretched sins. So you must admit that you're a sinner. You must believe that Jesus died on that cross for you, that he was buried in a barred tomb for three days. And after three days, God brought him back to life. That's called the resurrection. And then you must confess Jesus as Lord. You must confess him as Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, For with your heart you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you believe that Jesus died for you, that he was buried in that barred tomb for three days? And after three days, God brought him back to life. That's the resurrection. We celebrate that at Easter time every year. And then one of the greatest verses ever written is Romans 10, 13. For whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All you have to do today is to call on the name of Jesus and he will save you today. America, are you listening to the powerful voice of Almighty God. If you've never really and truly been born again, today is the day for you to make the greatest decision that a spiritually lost person can ever make. Repent. Turn from your sins. Ask Christ to forgive you of your sins today. Author Jim Black gives us 10 warning signs of a culture, of a nation in crisis in his book titled, When Nations Die. First of all, the crisis of lawlessness the crisis of lawlessness. Secondly, a loss of economic discipline. A loss of economic discipline. Thirdly, a rising bureaucracy. A rising bureaucracy. Number four, decline of education. The decline of education. Number five, a weakening of cultural foundations. A weakening of cultural foundations. Number six, a loss of respect for tradition. A loss of respect for tradition. Number seven, an increase in materialism. An increase in materialism. Number eight, the rise in immorality. A rise in immorality. Number nine, a decay of religious belief. A decay of religious belief. And number ten, a devaluing of human life. A devaluing of human life. Mr. Black wrote this book in 1994. How prophetic. Ted Koppel, who founded the news program Nightline, said many years ago, and I quote, the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. What are the Ten Commandments? Number one, God says you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, God says you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Thirdly, God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God doesn't have last name. Number four, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the let Lord bless the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Fifthly, God says, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Number six, God says you shall not murder. You shall not murder. Seventhly, God says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Number eight, God says you shall not steal. You shall not steal. Number nine, God says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. America, please listen to the powerful voice of Almighty God. He's speaking to this nation today. God said through the prophet Hosea in Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols let him alone. What happens? What happens when a nation abandons God? Is it too late for America to turn back to God? Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin 
is a disgrace, is a reproach to any people. 245 years ago, the United States of America began a journey and called itself one nation under God. We have become so entrenched in achieving the American dream of health, wealth, and time to enjoy them that we've drifted off course. We've not heeded the road signs, the Ten Commandments, and we've lost our way. The United States of America, a nation that was predestined by Almighty God to be a shining light to all nations, has fallen off a moral precipice into an immoral abyss. We are a disobedient people in these United States of America. We're a compromising people. We're committing adultery and calling it an affair in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. We're killing babies through the process known as abortion and calling it family planning. Jeremiah 1, 5, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. We're handing out condoms to our teenagers and then telling them to have safe sex in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. We're committing spiritual adultery as Christians whoring after the evangelical gods of big budgets and big buildings and then disguising it with evangelical jargon in James 4, 4. We're giving our stamp of approval to homosexuality and calling it an alternative lifestyle. Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus 20, 13. Revelation 21, 27. Romans 1, 26 and 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. We're allowing women to fight in war, to preach the gospel, and to be deacons and calling it equal rights. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, we're killing the elderly and the terminally ill and calling it death with dignity. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, we're electing public officials who are amoral, meaning they have no morals, and then we state, well, it's always been this way. We're throwing God out of every area of public life in the nation which He predestined to be a shining light to all nations and then calling it separation of church and state. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Preachers are compromising the integrity of the pulpit and watering down the gospel to do as they say, and I quote, make the gospel more palatable and culturally relevant. End of quote. Peter Jennings, the late commentator, calls it Christian light. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And then we're looking for a fast buck and a cheap frill with the purchase of a lottery ticket and calling it gaming instead of what it really is, gambling. Jeremiah 17, 11, 1 Timothy 6, 9, verses 17 through 19, and Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. We are disobedient people in these United States of America. We are compromising people in these United States of America. America, please listen to the powerful voice of Almighty God. He is speaking to this nation. And He said through the prophet Hosea, in Hosea 4, 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. What happens when a nation abandons God? Is it too late for America to turn back to God? Proverbs 14, 34 states, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. Sin is a disgrace to any people. The Scriptures tell us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that Solomon dedicated the temple to Almighty God. And when he did that, the glory of the Lord filled it. Then God made a covenant with Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The living God of heaven and earth gave Solomon the conditions for national forgiveness of Israel's sins. First of all, humility. You must come to God humbly. Secondly, prayer. We must pray and repent and ask God to forgive us for our sins. Thirdly, a longing for God. A longing for God. God wants us to hunger and thirst for Him as never before in our nation's history. And number four, repentance. Repentance. Repentance means you change your mind about your sin you turn from your sin and you ask Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins. The Bible says in Acts 3.19, Repent and be converted that your sins will be blotted out when the times of refreshing will come 
from the presence of the Lord. I personally believe that from the very beginning of time that America was in the heart and the mind of Almighty God. Christopher Columbus said that he discovered America under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. His own name meant Christ bearer. And this was a clear indication to him that God had called him to carry the light of Christ into the darkness of undiscovered heathen lands and to bring the inhabitants of those lands to the holy faith of Christianity. He states, and I quote, It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel His hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question, he states, that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because He comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. End of quote. America, please listen to the voice of Almighty Holy God. He is speaking to this nation today. God said through the prophet Hosea, in Hosea 4, 17 in the Bible, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. What happens when a nation abandons God? Is it too late for America to turn back to God? Proverbs 14, 34 states, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This nation has been blessed by the living God of heaven and earth like no other nation on earth because the people who founded this nation sought the heart of holy God. George Washington, this nation's first president, said, and I quote, It is impossible to govern rightly without God and the Bible. We've become arrogant and full of pride. We've developed an attitude of self-sufficiency. Our leaders have led us away from the God of our forefathers. Benjamin Franklin said this to his associates who were writing the Constitution, and I quote, In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine intervention. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent in instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we no longer need his assistance? He states, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of the truth that God governs the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. I firmly believe this, he states. I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interest. Our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a byword down to future ages. And what is worse, Mankind may hereafter, from this unfortunate instance, despair of establishing government by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, or conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth, prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed with our business. End of quote. America, please listen to the voice of Almighty Holy God. He is speaking very loudly to this nation today. He said through the prophet Hosea, in Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. What happens when a nation abandons God? God will abandon the nation. Proverbs 14.34 states, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, states, and I quote, The lost for enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved. Dr. John MacArthur states, and I quote, The major point of Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32, is that when men persistently abandon God, God will abandon them. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 
26 and 28. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Dr. MacArthur goes on to say, even when God's own people ignore and disobey Him, He may temporarily abandon them. In Psalm chapter 81, verses 11 and 12, God states, But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them up under their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Hosea reports the same tragic reality concerning the unfaithfulness of the northern kingdom represented by Ephraim to whom God said in Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. In his message to the high priest and other religious leaders in Jerusalem, Stephen reminded them of when the ancient Israelites rejected the Lord and they erected and worshipped the golden calf while Moses was on Mount Sinai. He states in Acts chapter 7, verse 42, Then God turned and God gave them up to worship the host of heaven. That is the demon-inspired deities that they had made. Paul declared to a pagan crowd in Lystra in Acts chapter 14, verse 16, Who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. When God abandons men to their own devices, His divine protection is partially withdrawn. When this occurs, men not only become more vulnerable to the destructive wiles of Satan, but they also suffer the destruction that their own sin works in and through them. I do not care what any religious leader, any business leader, or any politician, or any president, or any dictator anywhere in the world has to say. Homosexuality is not God's design. It is a perversion of God's original design for sex between a man and his wife only. And it is perverted by the devil. It is the devil's design. Leviticus 18.22 states, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 states, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. It is sexual perversion in its highest form. 1992, I met one of the finest men I've ever known in my life, and I'll never forget, he looked at me on that day, and he said, Jeff, I'm not a Christian man. I know there's a God, but I'm not a Christian man. On weekends, my wife and I travel. That's our time together, our time off. He said, what do you think about homosexuality? And I answered his question with a question, what do you think, I think, about homosexuality? He said, oh, you're a Christian. You believe the Bible, so you believe that it's wrong. I said, you're exactly right. He said, you know, I don't ever read the Bible. They have this beautiful house here in the woods, and I watch these animals all the time. He said, I've never seen two male squirrels mate. I've never seen two female rabbits mate. He said, homosexuality just doesn't make any sense to me. End of quote. If you're teaching children that God does not mean for them to be the sex that they are, shame on you. Shame on you. Saint Ignatius of Loyola said, and I quote, give me the child for the first seven years and I'll give you the man. End of quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Paul asked the question, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, people involved in the homosexual lifestyle will not go to heaven when they die. They will go to hell unless they repent. I believe that AIDS is God's judgment on the sin of homosexuality. 
God told the children of Israel in Judges chapter 10, verse 13, Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods, therefore I will deliver you no more. God's Spirit came upon Azariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. The Lord is with you while you're with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. In 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 20, through Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, God again said to Judah, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, He also has forsaken you. Is it too late for America to turn back to God? It is not. Is there any hope for America? Yes, the cross on which Jesus died is our only hope as a nation. We must come back to the God of our forefathers right there where you are today. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you for some time about your life. And today is the day for you to repent of your sins and accept Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior by faith. I want you to pray with me right now. You just stop and pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I know that you died on the cross for me. I repent. I turn from all my sins. Please forgive me. I now accept you as my Savior and I follow you as my Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me, I pray. I give to you, sweet Jesus, complete control of my life. Thank you for saving me. Give me the peace that I have been saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, you've been transformed by the power of God today. Your name has been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven where it will never, ever be erased. All of your sins are forgiven. And I love you, and I want to help you in your new walk with Christ. You write to me today and let me know of your decision. I want to encourage you to get involved in a good, balanced, Bible-believing church in the community where you live and ask your pastor to baptize you. I love you today. Live for Christ.